Great. It, it is a, it's a simple process. Uh, when we finish up here, we're actually going to let a piece in over, and you'll see just how well that will actually hold once you cool it down. Because as this is starting to cool down, it's actually starting to stiff up, stiffen up. And if our little flaw did not crack, and if you accept the fact that there is spring back, you can take a look and you can see that there's no cracks anywhere. So is that spewing? Well, that is African mahogany. It's ribbon. Uh, shoot across the side. Is there any? I don't even think there's any cuffing on there. I think that stayed pretty straight. This is a wrap. It's a commercially available router speed control, and what it's doing is sending pulses of full energy like if you sit near a light switch. And that will actually hold that temperature to probably within five degrees once it balances down. And you'll see that go down from the 270, it's not going to lay flat. By having it pinched, you can bend a nice set of, of purfling and do almost anything that you want. And it works pretty well. So if I'm going to bend, and since we're going to do cutaway, we're going to take a chance to bend it or cut away. I'll tape it. You can wrap tape it, you can end tape it, don't matter. There's a lot of techniques you can do. And it will probably stick to the slack. The glue will penetrate the paper and will stick. So you got to you want to think about that when we do that. I'm going to dampen it just like the side set and you'll be able to bend them very well. This is a piece of sycamore. Anybody ever use sycamore? I love sycamore. Uh, in fact, people you can take a look to see how it's taped together. That's that's what I call a lap bend, and that's what I call a wrap bend. It's a carriage bolt. It was actually the most economic pin I could buy. So I don't have a bolted in there because people say, well, I don't have my nut for that. You don't need it. It's just a pin. I will lock this in with the nut though, because I need some friendly friction to keep it from falling down on my head. And this was a gift I told you from one of my friends. I use a turnbuckle for my spreader. But this works, you can use almost anything. And what really makes this nice is when you put this in here, you will feel how tight this gets. Now at this point, I'm just kind of snugging this against. And the one thing you need to see is this. Uh, I have really nice machine parallels. I'm just using this to show you. You want something that is reasonably exactly the same as the other. You're going to put your mold on a plane. We have the top down on a flat surface. All right. I now have a datum point for making any measurement that I need to make. I can now lock my spreader in. And now you can see that is in there. So the next thing I want to do, and this jig is a very proprietary jig, uh, plumber's flange, six inch nipple. That's all you need. I have it set up that it's center to the guitar, length to width. And that's going to keep this from spinning for me. If you get down and squat and look at here, you can see that I have pre-shaped my side for my pattern. So you can see that there's pretty much a radius already in here. Uh, there are some guys that will just do this as a wedge shape. So if you can, this is a handy little jig because all of my molds will fit on here. Drew a line, found the center, put my first mold on here, clamped it down, went to the drill press, drilled the hole. So now I can drop that in there when I'm, when I'm doing what I call driving the bus. This remains reasonably stable. Uh, it can move around. The paraboliking action is going to be self-leveling. It's not a big deal. Then when you get another mold, you can center it, clamp it to this, go to the drill press, <coughs> drill from behind, and you don't have to, you know, you don't, it'll work. Other people have other methods of doing it. This is the way I did it. And somebody's going to ask me, well, why don't you put the kerfing in first? Well, uh, this is a, it can be a little bit of work. This way, I can true this up, put my kerfing on, use my thumbnail as a guide, 
and now I don't have to work so hard to remove so much kerfing. Kerfing's a quarter inch wide. This is less than a tenth. This will go down a lot quicker than the kerfing. So I will take the unhandled disc, and this will true up my back. And we get to make some dirt. And you can see we're starting to take off white. And I'm going to do this until it's all gone. Anybody want to drive a bus? I believe the Martin spec is 20 on the back for dread, 15 for the, the triple O's on down. Uh, I do not think that the radius you pick is going to make the guitar sound better or worse. It's what I use. Uh, I really don't think the back is going to work that much like a funnel acoustically. Do you, Sylvan? No. I mean, the, to me, what's important is your back braces are cut at the same curve. Whatever that is. Whatever it 15, is. 15, 16, I don't care. Yep. It, it does. As long as they're all the same. It does not matter. Now, we all agree, through your bracing, through your sides, through your curving, you're going to get, number one, not only are you going to get a much more professional looking it's taking your building to the next level. When you look at the glue joint, you now have a perfectly shaped, matching. Martin actually on their top has a, an angle. They really, they don't have much radius on the top. They use about a 40 foot radius brace actually. Uh, I as a, a kit maker build, I make my top braces to match the 28 foot radius. Again, this little parallel, as you can see, we're rocking. So it's very going to be very difficult to work on that platform without making it a little bit more solid. So my parallel just fits right underneath there. Now I'm, I'm pretty good. Your fingerboard comes over at the neck and will end up somewhere about here. So you can take your fingerboard, lay it there, kind of eyeball to this point. You know that your saddle is going to be somewhere around here. What I like to do first is I like to square the top up. Then that's going to set you up that you can see that makes it reasonably stable to do this next step. You take your, your dish, and since you have a flat and a radius side, this is a 28 foot, and this side is nothing, this is flat. I generally like to put this on here and just chew this off. You can measure the four corners that you're, you're, you're parallel to the mold. I forgot to put my little pins in there. No, it didn't. They're in there. Yep, they're in there. Anyway, I'm going to set this up, and I, I referred to a datum point. We know that when we set this up, the mold was parallel to this. So therefore, I want this to be parallel to the mold when I'm done this step. Because there's going to be some linear issues between this plane and my side set. So, I now will get the top reasonably reasonably flat. You can see where it's coming down. And again, I'm not going to worry about having every little, every spot dead perfect because I'm going to be doing this again when I put the curving in. And at that point, this is getting us really close. Let's say I'm going to take this down to a 16th or a 32nd, and then I'm going to true it up with the curving in it. But by doing this, we only have to take off a little bit of curving instead of a half of the curving. And I've seen people actually take their curving down to the point where they're glue, and that's what the curving's important for, down about an eighth of an inch. So you want to have as much glue surface as you possibly can. This is 80 grit. Okay, you can see that's coming down pretty quickly. a little bit more is coming off. In fact, if you get down and look, you can see that there's a little bit of a hollow spot in here at the waist, just a hair. All right, you can see with that it's not right and flat. At this point, I could take measurements, and if I have to come down on this side a little bit, I can put weight on it. So once I have this trued up, will you take that clamp off? Off of that bending, yeah. Yep. 